Hello, I would like to give you an introduction on how to use the weather data displayed by your ADL in-flight weather device. This presentation is going to be only about the actual data you're going to see on your iPad or Android device. If you have any questions on how to actually operate the hardware and similar, please have a look at my other videos. Today I did download uh, some weather for you and uh, even though this is mainly a European system with some customers in Brazil and Australia. Um, for today, I did download some weather data for the United States as they simply have some very interesting convective weather which we don't have in wintertime in Europe. If you look at the screen, we have a beautiful cold front and currently we are just looking at the radar data. So I'm going to zoom in a bit. This cold front is a very good example of convective weather. So looking at the radar information, we see that there are basically four to five colors. So um, we have the green dark area, which is an area where no radar echoes are detected, but it's within the coverage of the radar. Just to give you an example, we, if we go out here on the ocean, we see that the brighter areas are outside of the actual radar coverage. So this means that we simply have no information what kind of weather is out there. So for example, on the coast, this is due to the radar station placed on the ground and they just have a limited range out on the water. And the darker areas are areas which are in the coverage area, but which have no detected precipitation or radar echoes. Then the green area, the brighter green, this is the first level of radar echoes. So the radar beam did detect some particles in the atmosphere. Usually those particles are water, but they could also be dust or in some ca cases even some obstacles like a flock of birds or similar. But in this case, it's a pretty clear example that this is uh, definitely precipitation of water in the atmosphere. This does not necessarily mean that the precipitation is also present on the ground. So the radar detects this water or ice crystals in the atmosphere, but it doesn't mean that they necessarily have to fall all the way to the ground. It could be that some convective weather is basically um, keeping them in a circular movement in the atmosphere. This is very important because uh, some people think if there's a radar echo, it definitely has to rain on the ground or similar, and that's not really true. Now we see the, the colors gradually building. We have the green areas and then the next uh, intensity is the yellow and from there on we have the orange and the highest intensity is, is red. So on the ADL systems you basically have four colors for active radar echoes plus another two colors um, which either mean there's no echo or it's outside of the coverage area. Before I go more into detail, some general warning, like the ADL in-flight weather system is obviously a non-certified system and there could be errors of all kind, errors in the radar stations, error in the transmission or error in the display on your iPad or similar device. So please always just use it for situational awareness only. Never use your primary source of navigation or weather avoidance. Um, there is always some temporary delay in the data, so the weather could have moved or there could be an error and you could end up in a, in a very bad situation of relying on data link weather only. That being said, it's a very powerful tool. Just as an example to compare this with onboard radar, the typical range of a general aviation onboard radar is about 60 nautical miles. Many will have a dial where you can select a, a bigger range but uh, usually this does not really work out. So you have a 60 nautical mile range and on the left bottom of the current screen you see a, a, f a 50 mile scale. So if you imagine that you have just a little bit more than this of visibility, you will see that you never will get the big picture of this whole frontal area. It might be possible to approach the front basically at an angle and then to see the cells right ahead, but if you are flying along the frontal area, for example, um, searching for a weak point where you might be able to cross, here we see that in this area the front is not as bad as more to the northeast, for example, then 
it's basically impossible with the onboard radar because of the limited range and also because most of them just show you 45 degrees to either side then add some wind from the bad side and in the end you only have maybe 30 degrees of visibility towards the frontal area which with a limited range does not really give you the big picture many pilots ask me um, what color of um, weather radar they should fly in or avoid so the general rule is that uh, obviously from the green to the red the intensity increases but i emphasize that it's very important to understand the nature of the weather if you have a, a big green area which is just a snowfall without much convective activity and basically no orange and red in there at all then you might have a not so unpleasant flight experience in there depending on your aircraft performance but if you look at this frontal area it's definitely highly convective and active and in general i would um, suggest to avoid the whole thing even including the green areas because you never know um, what's in there and the highly convective cores in the red area are pretty close so there could also be hail f falling out from the top of the uh, of the thunderstorm so just avoid this by a, a wide margin obviously it depends on aircraft performance and your your personal minimums but i suggest to stay at least 20 nautical miles from any convective area in case of such a, a bad cold front i would even stay away 30 or 40 miles the next thing which is very important is to combine the different weather products so um, currently we just had a look at the radar but um, next thing is we are going to activate the strikes and as we see we have quite some strike activity in here so every Mangenta cross is a little area where some strikes have been detected in the last minutes so you see the the strikes they they line up very well with the the central area of our cold front and where we have the the baddest course i will go, going to zoom in on this one for example where we have the, the red course we also have the most lightning so th what does this tell us the first thing we can learn from us is that most probably the radar strike and ADS system is working properly because the strike and the radar they are measured completely independent from each other and so if in the final image they overlay as good as they do in this example this is a very good indication that all systems are working properly the next thing is that obviously the strike um, is another indicator that those cells are very active in some areas we might not have radar images or in the mountainous area also some cells can basically hide behind mountains but often the lightning is still detected so if we just have lightning and lighter um, radar echoes also be beware most probably um, it is worse than you expect because some of the convective area is hidden from the radar antenna we have this frontal area and the, the next weather product we can add is the infrared and we see the infrared also aligns very well with this frontal area what the infrared does it measures by it measures the height of the clouds by approximating the temperature of the highest cloud layer so it cannot see in, inside the cloud it just sees the highest layer but if you have convective activity and a thunderstorm activity usually the clouds will grow pretty high so i'm going to deactivate the radar and you see that the area which uh, the most intensive infrared color which means that the tops are going to be at or above flight level 350 approximately um, pretty much lines up with the lightning so even without the radar information we are pretty sure with the strikes and the infrared that we have some well, very bad weather in this area and now if we also add the radar i'm going to hide, hide the strikes for a moment we see how this lines up what we also can see is that the radar is a lot more precise so the um, the infrared is, gives us a very good indication where um, convective weather is but the, the fine structure with the little cells and where the frontal area is exactly um, cannot really be detected from the infrared so the infrared 
is always going to be less precise and more than a generous thing while the radar is much more precise on this. As three weather products, the radar, the infrared and the strikes all line up, we can be rather sure that our system is working properly and that we have some real bad weather in here. So we are going to look at some more weather products and in the end we might have a d discussion what kind of flight strategy you might have to get across this front or maybe in this case this might also be not possible at all depending on your aircraft performance. I hide the infrared to declutter the view a bit and we can also add the wind information and I switch to flight level 340 for in general for, for frontal areas and in convective areas it's very interesting to look at the wind at higher altitude even if your aircraft is not going to fly that high usually those systems are going to move in the direction of the high altitude wind while the low level wind is not so important and here you see many areas with a wind velocity well over 100 knots i see 130 knots in the frontal area and as usual the wind is going to blow in a very strong base nearly parallel to such a frontal area so we see yeah, in the frontal area 130 knots and in the area around it 100 knots from the southwest next thing we can add we can add the temperatures and as it is winter, we are going to see that at flight level 340, we are around uh, minus 50 degrees Celsius or minus 45, depending the area you look at. The next thing we can activate is the color-coded minima. Those are basically metas which have been coded into color codes. The first thing we instantly notice is that we have a huge number of airports with a windsock. So all those are airports which in their meter report more than 20 knots of ground wind. So if we go along this frontal area, we, we see really many wind socks. The next thing we see, it's a little bit independent from our frontal area, is that here in the northeast we have many red areas. So basically all those airports have um, visibility below cut one approach. So. Um, from European perspective below 550 meters RVR or ceiling below 200 feet. So now we had a look at all the all the different weather products and the next question is um, what would we do with this operationally? So best thing obviously is if we don't have to fly at all but if uh, for some reason we have a mission to cross this front how would we approach this? So. It obviously it depends on, on your aircraft performance and on your personal experience and aircraft equipment. But in general, I would say that with most general aviation aircraft, except some high performance jets, you, you would have very big difficulties crossing this front in this area we are currently looking at. So we saw that the tops are over flight level 350 and uh, basically going in IMC with those um, cells is at least going to be a very unpleasant experience. My personal view, but without uh, additional onboard radar to avoid the cells on very short notice, I would not even try to fly past it. And with onboard radar, I would probably not do it. You could try it, but uh, would not do it. If you definitely had to cross such a frontal area and you have onboard weather, then I would um, try to head for the weakest spots in this front on the data link weather and verify with the onboard weather. So for example here we have an area where there seems to be a, a little gap but that might be closing in a few minutes so be very very careful but you could try to identify such a, such a gap and then navigate through it with the onboard radar. The next alternative on such a frontal area is to try to fly around the end. So um, if we go down here, we see that the strikes um, stopping at some point and we only have, um, have separate ones and a little thunderstorm with the, um, with the strikes down low. So going to the south, this frontal area is, um, is going to get weaker. So if you ha can flight plan in this direction or have enough fuel, probably it's a, it's a good idea to fly along the frontal area and then around the end. Another strategy will probably be to, to land quite close to the front and simply wait until it passes. So waiting a few hours until it gets past 
and then taking off on another side on the back side in better weather um, in fact that might be the best option in this case so as you see data link weather is a great tool and often you can use it uh, to navigate around weather but this is one of the occasions where depending on aircraft profile and your route there might be no real gap but then also the advantage of the in-flight weather is that you realize this early on and then you can search for for a nice destination with a good restaurant and hotel and so on and uh, be land well in advance and wait until the weather passes without uh, data link weather you might fly very close to the frontal area and then visually search for a gap which you might not find and it's going to be a lot more stressful to to land before you can even visually see the bad weather and just wait until it passes so thanks a lot for watching and remember those are my very personal views on the weather situation and the ADA system is a non-certified system so um, if you have any serious doubt about how you conduct your flying please uh, talk to a certified flight instructor or look at official publications and uh, certified weather systems but uh, beyond that the ADA system can give you a very good situational awareness 